Exodus chapter 7, as we continue in this journey of discovering more about God and how amazing He is so that we can worship Him. So, there's something about human nature that we're really drawn to superheroes. Who's your favorite? I don't know, Batman? Iron Man? Spider-Man? Wonder Woman? Who's your favorite superhero? Jesus Christ. <laughs> there we go. He is the ultimate superhero. But you know, those stories of Batman, Superman, whatever you want to pick, whatever superhero you like, those stories are very similar in their plot line, right? The strength and the power of the superhero is magnified by the fact that there are bad guys who are going to lose. In the book of Exodus... It's about God's people oppressed, they're in slavery, they're beaten, they're abused, they're in slavery to a whole bunch of bad guys. And Exodus really is a story of God who promises to lead them out of slavery. This process is happening in these chapters we're looking at now. He's preparing them to be able to relieve, be relieved of the bondage and the slavery and move into freedom, and in the process, in the meantime, they are going to see that the Egyptian bad guys, all these bad guys that are in their world, are going to lose. He's dealing with the bad guys. And in the process of us reading about these things, we get a glimpse of the incredible power of God. How magnificent and majestic He is. And what that does for us, we learn something about His strength and His power, and it leads us into a place where we worship Him as the God, the amazing God that He is, the God of creation. So today we're looking at really Exodus 7 through 10 and considering the fact that God is all-powerful. And I hope that's encouraging for you today. There's nothing we need to fear. God has everything under control. He is all-powerful. He is able. So Exodus 7 through 11, actually, is what's called the plague narratives. And it's about these plagues and God dealing with the Egyptians and this whole story. It really, the whole book of Exodus is a call to worship. That there's only one true, all-powerful God. And He's worthy of our worship. And so it draws us into a place of worship. And in Exodus 7 through 10, he reveals his power. And, and for us, as we consider this story and put ourselves into it even today, he powers us. He powers us up to overcome the darkness in our own lives so that we can walk in victory as overcomers and not be afraid of the darkness, but walk as children of light. So God's power for those people and for us shows up in his ability to do for them and for you, God's power shows up in His ability to do for you what you cannot do for yourselves. The, Egypt, the Egyptians have the, the people of God in slavery. And they are such in slavery, there's nothing they can do to escape their bondage. They don't have the power to do that on their own. So God steps in. And He is going to show them amazing things about the all-powerful God that He is, and He uses His power to set them free and powers them up to be able to walk in victory. So may I say, if you walked in this morning feeling weak, discouraged, defeated, powerless, like you're just tired and worn out, may I say to you, God has the power you need to take the next step and be encouraged in His strength, in His presence, in it. Whatever that would be, God has all the power available in His very person to help you with wherever you are today. That should be very encouraging for us. So some truths about God's power. In Exodus 7.10, we hear the story that was read for us this morning that Aaron's staff has turned into a serpent. If you remember, God did that with Moses before. So for him, this is nothing shockingly new. He's already had a preview. Aaron hasn't had the preview yet, but his staff turns into a serpent. 
And scholars think that it probably had like a crocodile's head because there was a god there in Egypt, a false idol that they worshipped named Sebak. It was a deity of evil, evil with a crocodile head. And this whole narrative is about God showing his power over all of these gods and idols in Egypt. And so Sebak is getting a show here that the serpent is thrown, the staff is thrown down and a serpent shows up. And it's an attack against really the predominant idol worship that is going on in Egypt, the idolatry that is so prevalent there. And that sets the stage for the ten plagues that follow it. Now, if you're using the book, there's, there's several pages of charts in there that show. I would encourage you to just dive into that and consider it and make some applications for your own life that the number of ways that God, with each plague, he's coming against one of these Egyptian gods. With each plague, he's showing that he is way more powerful than any false idol or false god that they could ever manufacture. And so one by one, he's tearing down the strongholds of these gods and revealing that he is all-powerful. Now, at any point, the Egyptians should have been able to wake up and say, whoa, wait a minute, God is God. He is the God of the universe. So, back to the story. They throw the, uh, the, the staff down and it turns into a serpent and then Pharaoh's magicians turn the staff into a serpent as well. They do the same thing. They copy the same miracle. Now, of course, Aaron's staff swallows up all the rest of them because God is all-powerful and God's setting the stage for this. But there's something important that we should note in the very fact that they could mimic the miracle. Some really important truths about God's power. God's power can be mimicked. God's power can be copied, imitated, duplicated, counterfeited. Miracles can be mimicked. There is a kingdom of darkness that is good at, at doing that. You know, maybe a picture of a ventriloquist would help. You know, a ventriloquist, a really good ventriloquist, can make the puppet's mouth move and say, you know, and a really good ventriloquist, you can't even tell that their lips are moving, but a good ventriloquist can really make that puppet say things and say funny things. The kingdom of darkness has demons that are really good ventriloquists. And they use the voice boxes of people to say things that are not funny. It's not funny that they have the capacity to do that. That's a warning sign for us. It's a warning sign as we pray for our friends. There is a kingdom of darkness who can use people to mimic God's power and do fake miracles and counterfeit things. Pharaoh's magicians were puppets. God sets people free, however. God sets people free when we put our faith in Jesus. And he gives us all that we need and he transforms us to become real people who speak with his words and his encouragement and display his fruit. Now I think of Pinocchio the puppet, right? All he ever wanted to do was be a real human boy. God does just that. He transforms us and gives us new life to be real people, the people he intended to be following him heart, soul, mind, and strength, and trusting Him for all that we needed. Demons of darkness can do counterfeit miracles. Do you know that demonic... We don't need to be afraid of demons. If we trust in Jesus, we have all the power and the victory. We're, we're walking in the light. We don't need to be having any fear about any of these things that I mentioned. We walk in the light, but we, it is wise to be aware of some of the tactics of the enemy. And to just be alerted sometimes that, oh, I need to be aware of that, of what's going on in this situation. Did you know that the demonic demons can attach themselves to things? People, yeah, they, they can oppress people. They can make people, you know, do things that they don't even know they're doing. They're good at that, but the demonic can also attach themselves to things. Were you aware of that? When we were in Asia, um, I got malaria, I got sick. I, I told you this once before, but I was so sick. Like the third time I had malaria, I was so sick that I, I just had this incredible fever. And, and God gave me like a kind of a short little vision of this headdress that we had bought when we went interior to Papua New Guinea. 
and we visited these tribes there and we bought this headdress for some people there that you know we thought it'd be a good souvenir so we took it home and put it on the shelf and just had it on the shelf and God kind of gave me a and a wake-up call. I, I feel like it was God speaking to me about, he gave me a picture of that headdress. So I asked Christy and the boys to take that headdress out in the backyard and burn it and pray over it, which they did. And immediately my fever was gone. I had a healing experience. So they look back on that. I'm convinced that that headdress was used in some demonic ceremony, some kind of evil. Maybe it had curses put upon it. And it affected us. Now, I don't need to fear that, but it's wise to be aware of it. We also, in Malaysia, when we lived there, lived next to a Hindu temple. I've spoken of that before. And the Hindus, once a year, I think it was on a Sunday morning, go figure, they would have this firewalk ceremony. Every day preparing for that firewalk ceremony, they would come to the temple at night and have all these chants and these worship things, worshiping this idol that they had built with an ugly thing, with evil looking yellow eyes and they, they would put it up there and they would worship it during the week and they would pray to get themselves filled up with demons. So that on Sunday morning when they did this fire walk, they would put this demon image at the end of the fire walk and as long as they stared into the eyes of that demonic figure it's amazing they actually could walk through the fire without any harm. It was purely demonic, but it was a mimic miracle. It was the thing of miraculous, but it was a counterfeit. There was power there, but it was not from God. So we might be wise to be aware of that. That there is a kingdom of darkness that can deceive us and see these things. So back to the Egyptian story in Egypt here, first plague comes up, God turns the water of the Nile into blood. And this was an attack on their wealth. It was really way worse than the banks failing. It was their economy that was wrapped up in the Nile. The Nile was like the lifeblood of Egypt. And now the blood turned it into a curse. They are experiencing the banks, everything is, everything is failing for them when the water of the Nile is turned to blood. Pharaoh and the Egyptians viewed the Nile River as a god. And they worshipped this god that was providing for them. It meant everything to them. And it had to do with their future growth and their economy, everything. The Nile River was crucial for them. Historical documents uh, even discovered a song that they would sing to the Nile River. Listen to this. Imagine singing this song to a river. Thou waterest the fields which Ra created. Thou art the bringer of food, creator of all good things. Thou fillest the storehouses. Thou hast cast the poor, cast. Thou hast care for the poor and the needy. You know, they were saying that to the Nile River. It was false worship of a false god. So when God turns the Nile River into blood, it's a devastating blow, and showing His power over this miniature little God with a little g, God of the Nile. False worship. Now we can think, oh, we'd never do that. That's crazy. That was way long ago. That's, that's really silly. Good application question for us to ask her. Are there any rivers that I'm trusting in more than I'm trusting in God? See, that's the point of these stories. As we apply them to our own lives, we step into the story and realize God is still speaking to us today. Is there anything that I'm trusting in more than God? Is there anything that's drawing my affections away from God? Because anything that I'm trusting in for power, trusting in for love, trusting in for anything other than God, that can become an idol that will let us down. So it's good to ask that question. What might I be trusting in outside of God. Maybe even another person. Is there another person I'm trusting in more than God or loving more than God? It can become a form of idolatry. The call to each of us is expressed in verse 16 and repeated a number of times. If you read all these chapters, you'll see this come up several times. Let my people go so they can worship me. 
God wants us to know that He is all-powerful and He alone is worthy of our worship. That's the point. He draws us into the magnificence of His presence so that we can be worshipers of Him. So, God shows His power by turning the Nile River into blood. And then Pharaoh calls his magicians together. And we get Exodus chapter 7, verse 22. But, again, the magicians of Egypt use their magic. And they too turn the water into blood. See, once again, the miracle is mimicked. They do a counterfeit miracle. They mimic God's power. So something really important to consider when we're thinking about mimicking. The Nile River is turned into blood. It goes foul. Really bad. I mean, the stench would be overwhelming. The fish are dead and floating by. It's a horrible scene if you put yourself into that picture. What do they do in response to that? Now you would think it'd be like, oh, wow, maybe we better consider this God of the Hebrews. But what do they do? What's their reaction? It's like, oh, we can do that. We can turn water into blood. Watch this. And they turn water into blood. Such a ridiculous response in my thinking. The only way to possibly explain that reaction is the level of their hard-heartedness and locked into deception. They were just totally deceived. And that's why they could have that approach as a reaction to this. The darkness of their idolatry took them to a place of deep deception. Here's a warning for us. Be aware and beware. Deception flows up out with counterfeit power. We need to be aware of that. That deception can happen and it flows with counterfeit power. That's, that's why we need to be people of the Word and we need to be in faith communities where we're connected in a Bible-believing group of people so that we can avoid it. Before we went overseas the first time, we went for a week-long training called Pre-Field Orientation, PFO for short. And it was a week-long intensive of preparing ourselves to go overseas and work in a cross-cultural environment where there's all kinds of evil around us and false religions and animism and all, all kinds of things. So, you know, it was a preparation time during that week. On the fourth day of that week, we had some sessions. We started with a session with um, the importance of community. Actually, that group of people became like a community of, of faith for us during that week. We got pretty close together during that week. There were about 45 of us, and every day we were working together and doing projects together and, and activities together. And we had this session then on day four of the importance of having that kind of community where you have a small group of some kind with prayer partners or something where you're staying accountable to a few people, a place where you can be real and honest and transparent. And so we actually did some of that in groups, and then we had a break, and then we had another session. And the instructor began this next section talking about how important authenticity was. And he said, by the way, and we really loved this, this instructor. He's a great guy. We were, you know, really fond of him. Great teacher. And he started the session by saying, okay, I want to be authentic with you, and I want to be honest and transparent. And I just want to share with you that I have had this ability all my life, and I've never revealed this in public before. I've never said this to anybody because I didn't know if I'd be accepted with this. It, it's, it's a gift that I have, and I just didn't know if in Christian circles it would be accepted or not, but I'm at the point in my life where I just want to share this, and I, and I want to just be authentic and real and transparent and, and get your feedback on this. And then he, you know, he did a demonstration. And he walked over to one side of the room, and he called on a guy, um, Sam, I don't remember if that was his name, but I, something like that. He, and, and he looked at Sam, and he, you know, told him what he was thinking. And he told him what he had been thinking about that morning. And then he, you know, said some things about him to him that, you know, he looked shocked. That, how could you know these things? Now he made it all very encouraged. It came out the he was Sam was really encouraged by it. It really lifted him up. He said some very positive, encouraging things to him. And then he went to the other side of the room and, and called out a gal. And, you know, like Debbie, and kind of kind of like 
read her mind a little bit and told her what she was dealing with and struggling with and very encouraging words to her that were really lifting her up. And so after he you know, did that little demonstration about how this gift works for him, this is what goes on in his private mind, and he's revealing this publicly for the first time. He says, okay, give, give me some feedback on this. What, what do you think about it? Could God use this for his glory? And there was a long conversation that came out of that. A pretty lengthy discussion that went everywhere from what about Scripture and what about this and that. What it came to at the end was, because, you know, we, we love this guy. And it, what it came down to, nobody verbalized opposition to this. The, the general consensus was, as long as you're using this gift for God's glory and encouraging people and, and being helpful to their growth, why not? And so he got all emotional. And it was like, oh, thank you. I've been carrying this burden for so long. I didn't know if I could even have the, the freedom to share this. I feel so validated and so empowered. And it was kind of an emotional moment. And then he said, okay, just so you know, the last 30 minutes were a complete fraud. I had two really good actors, as you noticed, that were prepped ahead of time. And this was all a lie. It was all manufactured. It was all set up. And, and he paused for a minute because you could see, if you could scope the room, you could see anger starting to come up in people's faces. It's like, what? But then he, after a little pause, let the emotion sink in. He was like, that's how easy it is to be deceived. All it takes is a charismatic personality and a little bit of trust, and it's so easy to be deceived. So, how do we make sure we don't get deceived? We make sure, first of all, that we're... It's why it's so crucial for us to be children of the Word. We have to know truth. We have to be studying this book to know that what is being said and done, we test everything by the Word of God. We're people of the Word so we know what is true and so that we know where to go and where to look when we have doubts. We have to be people of the Word. By the way, note in verse 24, if you have your Bible open, in chapter 7, verse 24, after the Nile River is turned into blood, it says that they dug along the riverbank to find drinking water for they couldn't drink the water from the Nile. They still could find drinking water by digging for it along the banks of the Nile. It, that speaks to me. It's like, no matter how foul the world is, no matter how things are falling apart, we can always find living water if we dig for it. So we dig in. We dig deeper. We know the Word of God. We are living in a day and age where this is crucial. That we know and believe and trust God's Word for what it says, what God speaks in it and through it. Be people of the Word. I know you know that. That's why you're here. I want to accent that and affirm it more and more. Dig into the Word of God and be people of the Word. And also, in addition to staying in the Word and embracing the Scripture, seek the discernment that the Holy Spirit provides. Discernment is so crucial. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you do have the Spirit. And then there's a growth process where there's subsequent things that happen where we get filling of the Spirit you might call it baptism of the Spirit. We're filled and filled with the Spirit because we so desperately need the fullness of the Spirit. Every day we get filled with the Spirit so that we have His discernment. Of course God speaks through visions and dreams and prophecies, but we need to be very careful in discerning how we deal with that and share that with others. We need the discernment that Holy Spirit Teacher will give us. And be in relationships of prayer with wise people who love Jesus. And watch for the fruit. Because if it's a God experience, it will produce fruit. It will be long-lasting. As we sat in that session that one day at PFO, I remember red flags going off for me. It's like, wait a minute. It sounds like divination, and the Bible's against that. And it says, you know, test everything with Scripture. So those thought processes are going through everybody's mind in the room, I'm sure. And it's like, what's the discernment of the Holy Spirit saying? And 
I felt some red flags, but I like this guy. He's a great guy. How could he be off? So I ignored it. We weren't in tight enough community yet to really trust each other and have accountability, so that was lacking. These things are crucial to be people of the word in relationships with others in community where we can keep each other accountable and trusting in the discernment of the Holy Spirit. So, then there comes a second plague, the frogs. <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of a funny one to me. But it wasn't funny for them. Can you imagine the stench when all those frogs died? Frogs. God's really taking it up a notch. But it says in Exodus 8, 7, but the magicians were able to do the same thing with their magic. They too caused frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. The magicians used the same magic arts to produce the frogs again. So again, they mimic God's power because God's power can be mimicked for a while, but it won't be matched for long. God's power cannot be matched. So the Egyptian magicians, they could mimic the miracles, but they could not stop what God was doing. We've only had two plagues now. We're two plagues into a ten-plague story, and God is just getting warmed up. 